I am the God that healeth thee. I am the Lord, your healer. I sent my word and healed your disease. I am the Lord, your healer. Again, a wonderful time to share the word of God with you, listeners. The Lord God bless everyone who has tuned in to the Bible Lecture Series on radio. A very good day to all the precious listeners out there. Please send your Bible questions and comments to my email address at BibleLectureSeries at gmail.com. BibleLectureSeries at gmail.com. I prefer email counseling, but you can also reach me by telephone on Fridays from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. at 54 3462 or zero two six eight six three nine five four zero. One important flaw in the existing theories of Bible translation is that they seek Bible meaning from two sources. Number one, at the lexical level in terms of binary considerations of text and meaning, and number two, at the target culture level in order to make the translated work culturally sensitive and acceptable to the target audience. For example, though Nida's Toward a Science of Translation enjoys, uh, published in 1964, enjoys a particularly influential status in translation, Eugene Nida himself is aware of the unsystematic nature of his practice-oriented approach. Now, however, the successful Bible translation method used by Jesus Christ in the New Testament did not go outside the Bible to seek meaning and cultural acceptability, but rather depended on itself, that is the Bible, to render meaning. And this is the method that is demonstrated across the several chapters of this book, Matthew and Intralingual Translation each chapter supplying meaning of Bible text from within the Bible itself. The theory of deriving Bible meaning from the Bible itself, as demonstrated in this book, has a scientific prototype found in Acts chapter 8 verses 26 to 39. And uh, the background to the translation problem of deriving correct and verifiable meaning is Acts chapter 8 verse uh, 26 and we read and the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip saying arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza which is the desert and then uh, still we are trying to map the scientific uh, uh, steps here and so we can see that uh, from Acts chapter 8 um, verse 26 we have uh, the background and then the next scientific step is the observation of the problem which is mapped onto Acts chapter 8 verse 27 which reads and he arose and went and behold a man of Ethiopia and eunuch of great authority and the Candace queen of the Ethiopians who had the charge of all her treasure had and had come to Jerusalem for to worship and then there is the research question, which is found at Acts chapter 8 verse 30, and it reads, And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Then next we have in the scientific process of research, we have the hypothesis, which is Acts chapter 8 verse 31, we read, and he said, How can I, except some, some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come and sit with him. Next we have, uh, in the scientific process, the literature review. And that corresponds to Acts chapter 8, verse 32. And it says, The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so open he not his mouth. And uh, in support of that is also Acts 8.33, 
that is um, still on the literature review and we read in Acts 8.33 in his humiliation his judgment was taken away from him and who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth the next scientific step uh, is the literary gap and ju justification for the research and um, this part of the scientific process corresponds to Acts chapter 8 verse 34 and we read and the eunuch answered Philip and said I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this of himself or of some other man then next in the scientific process we have the methodology and we have the corresponding verses as uh, Acts chapter 8 verses 35 and 36 and so for the methodology we see then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus and as they went on their way they came unto a certain water and the eunuch said see here there is water what doth hinder me to be baptized and next in the scientific scientific process we have the research result which is Acts chapter 8 verse 37 and we read and Philip said if thou believest with all thine heart thou mayest and he answered and said I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God then next in the scientific process we have the recommendation which is Acts chapter 8 verse 38 and we read and he commanded the chariot to stand still and they went down both into the water both Philip and the eunuch and he baptized him the next is the conclusion and publishing of the research result which are um, aspects of the scientific process of uh, inquiry and corresponding to that aspect of scientific inquiry is Acts chapter 8 verse 31 and we read and when they were come up out of the water the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more and he went on his way rejoicing therefore in terms of the workability of a translation theory based solely on the Bible we see how Acts chapter 8 verses 26 to 39 can be developed into a workable Bible translation methodology with the steps of scientific inquiry adequately mapped out and also applicable to Bible translation. Notice in the above methodology that we just went through of Acts chapter 8 from verse 35 how Philip relied only on the Bible to interpret the Bible just as Jesus Christ also demonstrated in Psalm 118 verse 22 then in Luke chapter 20 verses 9 to 16 and then Luke chapter 20 verse 17 therefore this book is a test of such uh, Bible translation theory to determine if we could successfully replicate what Jesus Christ and Philip accomplished concerning existing translation theories uh, Edwin Gensler for example writes in contemporary translation theories that translation theory is and is not a new field though it has existed only since 1983 as a separate entity in the modern languages association international bibliography it is as old as the tower of babel anyone working monolinguistically may purport no need for translation theory yet translation inheres in every language by its relationships to other signifying systems both past and present notice how Gensler uses and creates associations between the terms translation linguistics and monolinguistically meaning one language in the same paragraph he does that thus clearly making the point indirectly that translation and interpreting within one language is an academic reality in translation studies 
One reason why translation theory lags behind translation practice is that, as we have observed from the references to Genesis and the 16th century translations of the New Testament into local languages, the practice far preceded the theory whereby several hundred years passed even before attempts at describing the process of translation were made. One of such attempts is Gideon Turi's descriptive translation theories and beyond that appeared as very late as 1995, a 300-page book that is heavy on the descriptive part of translation but thin uh, on the beyond part of translation. According to Gensler, theoretical approaches to translation began in the mid-60s with currently only five modern translation theories, namely the North American Translation Workshop, two, the science of translation, three, early translation studies, four, polysystems theory, and five, deconstruction. Given the marginal status of translation theory within literary studies, one will not find any heavy reliance on translation theory in this book, Matthew and Intralingual Translation, other than the strict adherence to the transfer of meaning using the novel perfect harmony method of Bible translation and interpreting, where meaning is Bible-bound rather than culture-bound. We go to our next subtitle in the introduction, which is the North American Translation Workshop. And so uh, in this segment, we're going to be looking at those five modern translation theories that we just mentioned. So we are on the first one, which is the North American Translation Workshop. In the early 1960s, the USA did not have a single translation workshop in their universities. And the North American translation workshops, which followed in its wake, considered literary translation as a secondary, non-creative activity, unworthy neither of serious critical attention nor of general interest to the public. Literary translations began to earn academic credits in the USA only in 1964. A key phrase that sums up the philosophy of this group of translation theories is that adherents of the North American Translation Workshop considered literary translation as a secondary, non-creative activity. Now we go to the next subheading, which is the science of translation. That is the second um, segment of the theory, modern theory of translation. That is the science of translation period. On the science of translation as holding theoretical values, Gensler writes, citing Joseph Graham, that much that has been written on the subject of translation yields very little when sifted for theoretical substance. The problem, writes Gensler, is not just a contemporary phenomenon with the North American translation workshops, but it is one problem that has troubled translation theory historically. As to the science of translation, Gensler writes that people practiced translation but they were never quite sure what they were practicing. At the same time as they observed some notion of equivalence and the same textual experience in both texts. We learn further that theories of generative transformational grammar in linguistics have been very influential in translation theory, especially to Eugene Nida's science of translation and culminating in evolving theories 
represented by Noam Chomsky's Syntactic Structures of 1957, and then uh, Eugenides' Message and Mission of 1960, and Eugenides Toward a Science of Translating in 1964, and Chomsky's Aspects of the Theory of Syntax in 1965. Over the years, Nida's theory in Toward a Science of Translating in 1964 has become the Bible, not just for Bible translation, but for translation theory in general, even though his work was initially practice-oriented rather than theoretical. In other words, just as the dominant theory in Literary translation is arguably Vinay and Darbelnay's Stylistique Comparé du Français et de l'Anglais, Méthode de Traduction of 1958. One can say that the dominant theory in Bible translation is Eugenides toward a science of Bible translation of 1964. Then the next segment of the trajectory of modern translation theory is called early translation studies that is number three early translation studies this is a post 70s conflict period whose writers distanced themselves from the conflict between the two dominant modes of research in the field of translation they focused primarily on literary concerns while rejecting theoretical pre presuppositions, normative rules, and linguistic jargon, according to Edwin Gensler. It is also a period that saw writers preferring to merge the two strands of translation activity where translation will no longer be viewed as literary and non-literary, but as both instead. While literary translators dismissed any scientific linguistic analysis, linguists dismissed non-scientific literary analysis. Intervening in the two conflict camps were a few writers, one of them called James Holmes, who distanced himself from theories of translation and from sciences of translation in his work titled The Name and Nature of Translation Studies that appeared in 1972. In this era, translation studies began with a call to suspend temporarily the attempt to define a theory of translation, trying first to learn more about translation procedures instead of trying to solve the philosophical problems of the nature of meaning translation studies scholars became concerned with how meaning travels. Another characteristic of this theoretical era was that even the distinction between original writer and translator was called into question. The object of study was neither an absent core of meaning or nor deep linguistic structure but rather the translated text itself. At this juncture, we point out that this book demonstrates a convergence of thought and position with the position of this theoretical era called early translation studies, which prescribes that the focus of translation should rather be on the translated text itself. The slight difference here in our two positions is that we advocate that the Bible translated text must derive its relevance from the Bible source text and not from situational or cultural requirements. Our position is thus a translatorial exemplification of the Akan Sankofa philosophy which stipulates a return to the origins in order to get wisdom to confront the future. The next modern translation theory period is called the polysystems theory period. The polysystems theory first introduced by Itamar 
Evan Zohar in 1990 is traceable to academic papers of 1970, 1977, and 1987 in the journal called Papers in Historical Poetics. Palace system means the aggregate of literary systems in a country, including high literature, canonized literature, children's literature, poetry, popular fiction, low culture literature, primary or secondary literature, and everything that passes for literature in a given culture, whether small and nascent or huge and established culture. In the Polish system theory, translated literature occupies a very important position in the overall literary history of a nation. It was within the Polish system theory that Gideon Turi, based on works done by Russian formalists, defined certain translation norms that influenced translation decisions. Work in the Polish system theory did not deviate from but expanded on concepts in early translation studies such as translation equivalence and literary functions of a text in a culture. While several translation theorists before Evan Zohar and Gideon Ture tended to look at how translation influenced literary and cultural conventions in a given society, the Polish system theorists opined that it was rather the literary norms and cultural conventions in the target system or culture that influenced and governed translation decisions, which is quite an accurate assessment when viewed against the backdrop of French language purists and translators whose philosophy of purifying the French language led them to constantly seek to weed out foreignisms that migrated into the French language. We go to the next modern uh, theory period um, of translation um, that is called the deconstruction period. The deconstruction uh, alternative arose in France in the time of the May 1968 riots and social disobedience to the de Gaulle regime. An adherent of this theory published their writings in the Parisian journal called Tel Quel. Scholars of the de deconstruction period such as Jacques Derrida and uh, post-colonial theorists of translation exposed the limitations of the Polish system theory and offer no new translation theory of their own, but new alternatives and ways of viewing translational phenomenon, writes Edwin Gensler. For example, the constructionists have the notion that the translator's work is an original. While all the translation theories reviewed above retain the notion of duality in the translation process of source and target text equivalents, deconstructionists radically question almost all the traditional views of translation and ask why the original should not rather be considered to depend on its translation. For this group of translation scholars, the original text does not exist without the translation, and it is the translation that gives life to the so-called original. This translation theory is also of the view that scholars should think along the lines of allowing the translation rather to define the meaning of the original text and not, as traditionally practiced, allowing the original to dictate what meaning the translation should adopt. More so, it considers that the identity of the so-called original text 
should not be fixed but should change in accordance with new elements in the translation. This translation theory questions even the idea of the term original and wants to know if what existed before the original was an idea, a form, a thing, a thought, an apparition, or nothing. In other words, the so-called original is also a translation, having derived from something else. Deconstructionists raise questions challenging fundamental notions in all the theories discussed above and also even question the questioner. Deconstruction theory questions the several definitions of translation and the boundaries that they invariably impose and use the absence of unanimity in the definitions of translation to demonstrate the instability of translation's own theoretical frameworks. One idea of deconstructionists is that every writer creates, creates his own precursors. His work modifies our conception of the past as it will modify the future. We go to our next theory of Bible translation, which is justification for the perfect harmony theory of Bible translation, and we will look at that in our next broadcast. This is where we will end for today. The Lord willing, we will have a new Bible lesson in our next broadcast. You have been listening to Dr. Peter Price of the Department of French, University of Education, Winneba. I thank you for tuning in and listening. Please send your Bible questions and comments to my email address at Bible Lecture Series at gmail.com. Bible Lecture Series at gmail.com. Again, the Ghana telephone numbers are 054 776 3462 or 026 863 Signing off on the Bible Lecture Series, I have been your host and Bible teacher, Dr. Peter Price. Until we meet again, May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ keep and protect you. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I am the God that healeth thee. I am the Lord, your healer. I sent my word and healed your disease. I am the Lord. Your